the harbor, in the inner harbor area, you found a place that approximates the excitement and the mixture of people that goes into making up the concept urban. Our speaker tonight is somebody who has had a long association with the city of Baltimore. In fact, he was born there, was raised there, graduated from high school, went off to school to the University of Virginia where he studied architecture and then received his bachelor's degree there and then off to Houston where he studied at Rice Institute and received a master's degree and then returned to the city of his birth and has been there low these many years. It's not often that a person gets a chance to have a dynamic impact on the, on the city where he or she was born and raised. He went back to work for the Baltimore Urban Renewal and Housing Agency during the 1960s and then became involved with the Housing and Community Development Department, became a deputy commissioner and then a commissioner, spent just about a year as the coordinator of downtown development and then was plucked from that by the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation to be active in the area between Capitol Hill and the White House in Washington, D.C. Jay Brody is someone who has been active in the business of urban revitalization and he's going to share some of his experiences and thoughts with us tonight. It's a great deal of pleasure that I Welcome Jay Brody to Ball State University. This is pure gin. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if you want to love um, it. It works. That's the main thing. Woody Allen said that these mechanical things are our natural enemies, so <laughs> we have to be on the lookout constantly for them to break down at the most embarrassing possible moments. And <laughs> And they usually will. Uh, as an ex-high school guard for the night <laughs> where Duke meets Louisville <laughs> for the championship of something or other in the Reunion Arena in Dallas, I said, do these people know what they're doing out there in Muncie when they're having this talk here? But I said, sure. And uh, since my UVA Cavaliers did not make it past the first round, and. Um, since nobody from the Big Ten or, uh, you know, <laughs> they didn't. Um, but perhaps you can go and see this later on tonight if, you, if you're basketball freaks, which I still am. Um, it doesn't, uh, it's not mutually exclusive from being a basketball freak and an urban freak. Uh, you can be both. And so in the middle of downtown uh, Indiana here, um, in Muncie, I'm going to talk to you a bit about Baltimore, pronounced by us natives, Balmer. Can you actually say that? Can you get your mouths around that? Balmer? <laughs> As in Balmer, Maryland. It's a terrible sounding thing. And Washington, D.C., which you have heard of for better or worse, full of faceless bureaucrats, profligate spenders, people who were elected. As Will Rogers once said, if they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't be there and they're not. So <laughs> they're out wandering around the country. Um, but a fascinating place. So I have been kicking around there for about two years. And before that, more years than, than uh, we need to talk about in Baltimore. Many of those years were spent in inner city neighborhood meetings. So I am used not only to questions and answers, but to non-negotiable demands and to manifestos and to statements and to stories of your lives and to <laughs> other things. If you would care to stand up and tell them as we go along, that'd be perfectly fine. So you shouldn't be shy in retiring, which I trust you're not. And, and uh, as we talk a little bit about older cities and new directions. Um, 
I'm going to do a little talking first without slides. That, that's very anti-architectural of me to do, I realize. But if you'll bear with me for a few minutes, you'll get to home base and you know, you'll feel much more comfortable when you're seeing slides and you can go to sleep, which is what I used to do at 8 a.m. history of architecture courses. So I know it's a, it's a useful thing to do. It's very restful. And there'll be some slides of Baltimore and Washington uh, in just a few minutes. But I was invited to share some thoughts about where this urban business is going. And so I'm going to do that. And I would be delighted if you debated and argued or thought about this with me because these are in no means a final form. Um, I expect as long as I'm around thinking about stuff, they will not be in final form. Um, and we're dealing in a field, this urban kind of revitalization or where cities are going, in which there are not only not answers in the back of the book, there's no book, uh, which makes life a little more difficult, but also quite interesting. Um, some people might say fascinating. And I'm going to lead off by telling you some useful aphorisms in this field. Uh, which you can recall as we go through slides and talk about other things. They come from different places. One is a French saying, which I won't say in France, in French, so you can't criticize my bad pronunciation, but the, the uh, translation of the saying is, the more things are, the more, they, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Hmm? You've heard that somewhere around. And like most aphorisms, it's part true and part not. And in terms of cities, it's part true and part not. Another thing is a, a, a notion by a, an American philosopher named George Santayana who said something like, it's been misquoted so many times that nobody really knows what he said exactly, but the notion was that if we don't learn from the mistakes of the past, we're doomed to repeat them, and it's a useful notion. The other notion is that if we have lemons, we should learn to make lemonade. I don't know who first said that, but it's a useful thought when you're dealing with cities and old buildings and areas that seem to be decaying. And finally, there's a, an authentic quote from a famous urban planner who said different strokes for different folks. And that was Muhammad Ali. And so if you would hold on to those ideas now as we go forward a little bit and think about, not too many notes, but a few. What's new in older cities? Where are we going? Where are we now, circa AD? 1986, right. And why is this a different sort of uh, era in terms of the way most of you, like me, uh, an American looking at cities and having an attitude, positive, negative, neutral, in reverse, <laughs> five gears, um, as to what we think about cities. And to just go back and reflect a minute what we used to think about them or what people who were here thought about them at the end of World War II. They had a very simple notion about cities. The notion was to get the hell out of them hmm? and to get out of the cities into the suburbs. It was a very deeply felt notion and it was supported, as it often is by in, in America, by not a series of clearly articulated great things called national policies because we're not prone to do that. We don't do it standing up either, but we're not prone to do it. You all there? Right, okay. <laughs> I'd like to check on you from time to time to make sure you're there. All right. But what we do is we do a number of individual acts which taken collectively form this mysterious kind of uh, fabric that was a policy. And after World War II, we did a number of these things. We were delighted to see people survive the war, and they were veterans, and we gave them veterans administration loans. It was a very nice thing to do. And we formed a thing called FHA for the Federal Housing Administration, which did more of that. Also, people had been saving money, clipping coupons throughout World War II, which I only vaguely remember. And they had savings to invest. And where were they going to invest them? They were going to invest them in cheap land and new housing in the suburbs and get away from all this old, decrepit, falling down stuff that they'd been stuck in for years because they couldn't move. Now, they had some advantages, wonderful advantages at that time. They had cheap gasoline. I remember that vaguely, and it's coming back, which is one of the curiosities of history, to go with the cheap land. So if you put those things together, just a few things, hmm? but a very deep, pervasive influence in American society, what you had was an anti-urban policy. Now, nobody thought of it that way. 
And if probably somebody said it, they would have said, oh, that's crazy. We never meant to do that. We don't hate the cities. We love the cities. We've made massive capital investments in the cities. But that's what it was. So out we went, particularly if we were white, and it gave us the added advantage of getting away from black people and poor people and other undesirable people. We're out there with other folks just like ourselves. Suburbs were nice and clean and green. The air was good. The land was cheap. And we could commute back in the cities because we had our gas guzzlers and the gas was cheap. All worked out perfectly. Didn't it? Hmm? Nice? Good? 3.4 kids? The whole works, right? Barbecue, two cars in the carport, club cellar, hmm? fireplace. Did we miss anything here? Just about it. Okay. American dream come true. Horatio Alger wins, you know, bottom of the ninth, guy hits the home run. End of the game. And a few people got left behind in this scenario. Regrettable, unfortunate. Poor people, black people, stuck in the cities, living in old housing, rats, mice, sled paint, nasty, unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And there were also people who owned things in the cities whose value began to depreciate, things called department stores, and they got unhappy. Mm -hmm. And most of those people went to Washington and said, help us, because not only were those folks going to the cities building those nice quarter acre suburban lots and the housing, but developers who may not be the smartest people on God's earth, but are also not the dumbest, said, look, if all those people are out there in the suburbs with all that disposable income, they've got to buy groceries, furniture, television sets, things like that. They don't want to go back to that dirty, old, sleazy, scummy city to do that. They want to go shop in a nice, clean, maybe dull, but perfectly free parking place called a suburban mall. They're going to be mauled. Hmm? And so we have mauled America. And we mauled it at the clover leaves where the interstates met. Great access, convenience, perfect end. <laughs> um, and so that suffering of downtown department stores created a little force, not the defense lobby, you know, not farm aid, but a little force in Congress that created a thing we used to joke about called Irving Renewal. We used to call it that until one guy called up one day and asked for Irving Renewal, and we said he was out. But, <laughs> but Urban Renewal came out of that, let's do something in the heart of the cities because commercially we're suffering. Baltimore, classic case, which you'll see in a little bit. And with no more great altruistic thoughts, wonderful reform society, make everybody rich, none of that. Very simple, dig down your pocketbook, you're suffering, Profits are going down, things look bad, department stores are closing, let's do something. A few people got together and, let's do it. and they did something. Now, the notion that was pervasive in that era, which is new is good, bigger is best, new and big is terrific, hmm? which was America summed up in about a sentence and a half, we have now changed that a little bit. Actually, we've changed it quite a lot. Why we've changed it is a little bit mysterious. I don't know the answer to this. But we have somehow come to think a little more about our roots architecturally and familially, if there is such a word, hmm? blacks, whites, ethnics, all those folks. Think about keeping buildings we used to throw away. Hmm? Thinking about what makes up this mysterious phenomena called a neighborhood. George Gallup got a million dollars to do a poll about what Americans thought about neighborhoods. Can you imagine that? You know what the answer was? Americans like neighborhoods, son of a gun. I would have done it for half a million. <laughs> hmm? And what is a neighborhood? You know, what does it have to do with? Well, I mean, we all live somewhere, right? And then in addition to living somewhere, which satisfies one of the great human needs called privacy that we all have, there's this other element that we forgot in America. We kind of put it aside for a long time. We lost it. We forgot how to define it. We were a little afraid of it. It's called community. Hmm? And so with privacy, on the one hand, if we could find this mysterious force called community, maybe we had something that used to be called a city. Hmm? Now, the way you used to get a community was to go to a bar. That was the simple definition. <laughs> you got out of your house, you left your family, your mother was yelling at you, your father was mad, sister and brother were arguing, you went to a bar, you had a couple of drinks, and you were convivial. Hmm? And that was the great meeting ground in every ethnic neighborhood in America, not to mention the old world. 
few churches and synagogues maybe, but more bars. <laughs> so there were corners in East Baltimore which were downtown Polish, German, Lithuanian, Latvian, Czech immigration in which there were four corners and there were four bars. <laughs> it was perfect urbanism. <laughs> you had your choice of bars and if you didn't like one, you went in another. People were happy. They were also drunk occasionally, but they were also happy. And they felt they were living in a neighborhood. Hmm? It was very special. And so we discovered when we went for a walk in the suburbs that there were no sidewalks. We said, son of a gun, we got to walk in the streets. What kind of neighborhood is this? We got to walk across somebody's lawn. They're going to be mad at us. They're going to shoot us. It's an invasion of privacy. Hmm? So you didn't think of a sidewalk as a public amenity, <laughs> but it is. Hmm? And it's something that cities had. And then we had some other things, which we'll get to in a few minutes about places to gather where you didn't have to feel afraid because you were black and somebody else was white or you were poor and somebody else was rich or you were old and somebody else was young but you could come together in a fashion in which you celebrated portions of life birth death great events victories defeats other things hmm? that happened which cities and civilization and society have something to do with and it doesn't have much to do with sitting in your club cellar in the suburbs watching television. That somehow didn't quite satisfy all those needs. Hmm? So we began to change our mind slowly, very slowly, hmm? about cities. But looking back now, 1985, 1986, you really see a pretty radical, I think the definition of that word means from the root, hmm? change in the way we've looked at neighborhoods, the way we've looked at cities, the way we've looked at ourselves hmm, as a society. And we've begun to think about things in a new way. Now one of the things we've begun to think about is what is the public role in this laissez-faire capitalistic society where 99 out of 100 decisions are made by private folks saying I bought this land, I'm going to put a building on it, nobody's going to tell me what it's going to look like, nobody's going to tell me how high to make it, if I want to make it out of cheesecake or green cheese or porcelain enamel panels, I'm going to do it because it's America, it's my right, it's in the Constitution somewhere. <laughs> Hard to find, but it's probably there somewhere. And that's part of all of us. And we are very anti-regulation, constraint, control, God knows all sorts of authoritarian systems which most of our parents got out of Europe and other places to come here to get away from. So that's very deeply ingrained in us. And what did we associate public and planning with was regulation, zoning, building permits, all kinds of forms we didn't understand, we didn't like. Greek gentleman who did a tavern downtown in Baltimore, and I went after he did it, he never got a permit. <laughs> and I said, why didn't you get a permit? What you did is perfectly fine. He said, you know, you would have, I would have had to bribe you. I said, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> you would have just had to come in, fill out the form. I don't take bribes. <laughs> Fill in the form, we'd approve it, it'd be fine. Now I wouldn't be mad at you. Now I'm mad at you because you did this thing without a permit and all your neighbors know it and they're going to want to do the same thing and we're not going to function that way. Different country. It's not the way we do it in the old country, he said. Well, there's still plenty of that in all of us. Hmm? So we don't like control. We probably don't like planning. And we're willing, maybe, to put up with a certain minimum amount of it. Hmm? You know, like we put up with air conditioning systems that don't work, and <laughs> traffic lights that malfunction, other bad things, microphones. Hmm? Why should we put up with planning? For a very selfish reason. Because if it's done right, it should add value to all our crummy individual property. Hmm? And collectively, it can produce something more than the sum of its parts, a word called synergism, which is a current cliche overused. Hmm? And so what we've tried to do in cities like Baltimore and Washington is get the public entity from the role of policeman, from regulator, into a participant in the engine of American development which is driven by private enterprise. If not right into the engine, the carburetor, you know, or the air filter or other things, maybe a co-pilot. Hmm? Now why do we deserve to be that, okay? Well first we said we're going to buy some land and so we're going to be land sellers and land leasers which is going to make us a participant. But more radical than that, we're going to put some money on the table. If you play poker, that's how you get in the game. Hmm? And so we put in Baltimore because we knew that Baltimore was not San Francisco, <laughs> was not New York, was not some other places where developers were flocking 
lusting to come and build things. The best lot we had in Baltimore in the Inner Harbor, we advertised for 10 years nationally. We had not a single taker. The 11th year, we had one taker, which I'll get to in a little bit. To play in the game, we said we're willing to put public dollars on the table to get higher quality design, better planning results, affirmative action, historic preservation, things that they have lied to you in Ball State and every other school and said they didn't cost more. Cost they, of course they cost more. Hmm? If you could get good design for the same price you could get bad design, <laughs> most people would probably choose good design. But it costs more. And so do a lot of other things. And so if we have public policy goals, it didn't seem to us immoral, un-American, or fattening, or any of those things, to say we will put some public money into deals for which we want a place at the table, for which we want some participation. Now, before I show you some examples, I'd like to, six questions, hmm? Six, I counted them, <laughs> to which I don't know the answers. You could help me with the answers, I'd be very appreciative. You can think about them. They're worth thinking about. I have to look down at my notes, this is tough. One is, this is America. It's not Europe. We miss the kings and queens. We miss the Medicis. <laughs> whoever would like to have been one, and the Sforzes, and all those nice people who had control over cities and designs and made decisions by fiat, we don't have that. What we have is not a democracy, as my friend Thomas Jefferson might have said, what we do have is a republic hmm, in which people participate. And so after 200 years, plus or minus, plus a few, hmm, a very cynical French gentleman said about America, it will be the only society that goes from barbarism to decadence. Hmm? George Clemens said, said that <laughs> around World War I. Missing maturity and other you know, possible stages of the growth of civilization. And I would like to think that that isn't going to happen. Hmm? But for it not to happen, what are the appropriate forms of planning and building for this Republican society? That is now, you know, post-adolescent. We've discovered girls, right? We've passed puberty. We're 200 years old. Hmm? We might have found or think about what is appropriate to us, not mimicking the past, not copying Europe, but saying what is authentic and genuine to America and how do we express that in architecture and planning. It's a question I'm not sure of what the answer is to. Hmm? Second question is, how can we create more than just a transitory structure. A transitory structure lasts between elections. Hmm? <laughs> Mayor, local, governor, state, president, national. It's not good enough. We need some kind of a structure or a format that goes beyond that, that helps us get above the worst design and the mediocre design into striving for excellence and qualities that we're all going to be proud of. We really haven't found that format, have we? And it might have something to do with design review, which none of us like much if we're the architects. <laughs> it might have something to do with more strict guidelines, which at least in my experience, the best architects like and the worst architects hate, because the best ones are still creative and find ways to deal with the guidelines. But out of this, when we look back at cities, this is a sacrilegious thing to say, we don't see buildings. We see an occasional wonderful building. What we see is public spaces. What we see is the way the public realm is dealt with, the waterfronts, the parks, the streets. Hmm? We think of great streets in great cities. How many great streets have we created in America? Not too many. Hmm? And why? And why can't we create, through a format, through a little more thinking, some great streets and some great spaces? Third is how can we make our cities more legible? These are also very inexact phrases, which I apologize for. They're just the best I can do at the moment. How can we make cities more legible, not just to the design professionals, all of you wonderful people here who can read drawings and know axometrics, <laughs> fancy phrases like that, and where a vanishing point is, hmm? but the average citizen to read a city to know where he or she is and how he or she gets from where he or she is to somewhere else. So there's a sense of location. So there's a sense of hierarchy. Hmm? We had a nice, simple, our ancestors had a nice, simple sense of hierarchy in Europe. 
was divided into very two simple words. One was a fortress, cities protected us against their enemies in times of war, and the other was a marketplace where we sold goods and we bought them. Hmm? They were two simple notions of what constituted the city. Maybe we don't need to protect ourselves. <laughs> I'm looking up for the SDI <laughs> shield over Muncie, <laughs> which I don't quite see yet. Um, in the same way as, as the fortresses of the past. But what is a sensible hierarchy, an order of value from our house to a more communal place, to a place where we work, to a place where we recreate, to whatever else we do in cities that we share as a society, okay? Now, I'd say that in a different way. Try to improve on that inexact statement. What is significant to us as a society? And how do we express that significance in planning and architecture? And what is not as significant? What is background to us? What are the buildings? What are the commonplace things? And how do we exercise some control and restraint in an era in which there are no structural constraints, as there used to be. There are no material constraints. We've got these god-awful catalogs that we can pick anything we want, any color, texture, fabric, material, and build the damn things, because <laughs> they'll stand up and run up elevators 100 stories. So we're not constrained by the, any of the civilizing factors of the past. We can do anything we can dream of, and we can dream of some pretty ugly things. <laughs> and most of them get built. So how do we exercise some constraint between the significant and the background. Hmm? And how do we hold on to local and regional character in a world in which we can see what the Japanese and they can see what we're doing instantly and copy us and we copy them. So we're the slaves to fashion, hmm? to instantaneous change and imitation to make us feel safe and comfortable like peanuts with the blanket that we're all secure under the same blanket and all our office buildings look alike and all our houses can look alike and all our shops can look alike and wouldn't that be dull? Hmm? And so the sense of specialness is in danger of being lost not only just in American towns and cities but around the world. How do we achieve some kind of better balance between the vehicle, which we all love, that two tons of metal sitting out here in the parking lot, and the pedestrian? Now, in some American cities, to walk is an automatically suspicious act. I mean, I was pulled over by a cop in Houston walking to the Rice Library. And he said, what are you doing? It was at night. And I said, I'm walking to the Rice Library. He thought for a moment. He said, nobody does that. <laughs> I said, well, now one person does it. <laughs> he said, would you mind if I follow you? <laughs> I said, no, true story. So he did, all the way to the Rice Library thus breaking the trend of people in Houston for a very short time, I think. Uh, but the notion of people out on the streets meeting each other, doing business, socializing, girl watching, very urban, very hard to do that in the suburbs. You could hang out at the suburban mall, but it's not much fun. Hmm? Street corners, other places, much better. Almost there. Hmm? How do we develop a sense of place and of time that is America. Sense of place. Gertrude Stein, when she was living in Paris, was once asked why she didn't go back to that city on the west coast where she was born. I won't name the city. <laughs> I'll tell you afterwards. She said, in her usual wonderful way, because there is no there there. Hmm? There was no specialness. There was no soul. There was no thing that made it different, so why bother with it? Hmm? And so many places either never had the there or the, we've lost the thereness of it in a sense of place. Hmm? Now what's a sense of time mean? We're in a very dynamic society. Things are changing all the time. We're not in the static Middle Ages where you did something 500 years it was still there. Not America, not at all. Hmm? And the only time we have captured in America, we have frozen one city. It's quite marvelous when you come to think about it. Williamsburg, Virginia. We have frozen it into the 18th century with the aid of all the money the Rockefellers put into it. But there's only one of those. Most of us don't live there. <laughs> Nobody does, really. And we live in these places that are changing all the time. And what is 20th century time, and how do we react to that change, which is not static, but which much more is fluid? The sense of community I talked about, I'm not going to go back to that, but it comes from a Latin word, you know, named communitas, 
and also used to go with another Latin word called civitas, civility, which is people in cities behaving toward one another in a civilized manner. Okay? We're going to try some slides and see if there are some examples of either successful or unsuccessful attempts to either answer these questions or get at some of these values. This is Balmer circa 1950 in the heart of downtown. Uh, let's try that again. <laughs> Can this go back? No, no. That's where I wanted to be. Ah, thank you very much. <laughs> This is the same spot 20 years later. Same spot, took out streets, made two very wise decisions. One decision that I'm not sure was smart or dumb. Produced some buildings, some mediocre, some ugly, <laughs> some better. Two wise decisions were tame the automobile by putting it underground. So there's three major parking garages which you can't see. Second good major decision, there were no public gathering places in downtown Baltimore. Since we had made the decision to put the car underground, let's put an open space over each garage. Three public open spaces of slightly different scales, each of slightly different character, subject I might add to being changed over time and improved. And then we did a semi-smart decision, we're not sure how it's going to work out, which was one of the first second level pedestrian walkway systems which you can see if you look toward the middle of the picture. The original notion, which did not work, which was on that second level system, you could put retail. We put a few and it died. <laughs> not everything works out. And in this case, it didn't. It's being attempted again today. And as is this park being redesigned again today, and this was an early Mies van der Rohe building. On the left-hand side, done by Barney Weisbord of Metropolitan Structures in Chicago, a gentleman who said there was more absorption of first-class office space in Baltimore than any Baltimorean believed, and he was willing to put some bucks in order to show that was possible. And it succeeded very nicely. Now, this is a plain, kitschy picture in that same space of Christmas downtown, an unthinkable notion because there was no place to go and do Christmas downtown except to look at a store window and keep moving on the sidewalk. So this Santa Claus scene is in that same space, and that became possible because somebody took the physical initiative to create a space that wasn't there. This is one of the other spaces. This is a grander space around a fountain, which was donated by a philanthropic local citizen, and shows, besides that, the juxtaposition of two old buildings, one great building, the original headquarters of the B&O Railroad, which was slightly to the right, a modest commercial traveler hotel, the Lord Baltimore, which is now being renovated with the aid of a UDAG grant, and a John Johansson theater, the mechanic theater, in brutalist concrete with a restaurant and a drugstore and some other stuff on the first floor. We got into the theater business as the city of Baltimore. We set up the Baltimore Center for the Performing Arts, a very nonprofit entity, which hired a gentleman named Alex Cohn from Broadway who produces the Tony shows and said, we think we've got an audience here that nobody knows about. And if you could help book us, some people from Broadway, and get us some decent shows, and we'll pay you for two years. Fees and expenses, that's it, no more. Don't come back and ask for again. <laughs> uh, we'll see if we're right or wrong. We were right. He brought us George C. Scott and Lee Ullman and Jason Robards and some other people. And we developed an annual subscription audience of 22,000 people in Baltimore, which was seen as unthinkable. And it is now a tryout town for Broadway and a place for 42nd Street and Chorus Line um, and Dream Girls and lots of good things in that theater that people thought was impossible to do. It took some heart to do it. We also thought that you could live in downtown Baltimore. Now, no one had lived in downtown Baltimore for 100 years since you lived above the store. Now, I grew up living above a store, and I thought that was all right, right? It was too dumb to know differently. But in terms of living in an urban setting in high density, no one had ever done that. And we talked one local developer named Charlie Mullen into doing these two towers. No HUD subsidy, no guarantees. He just did them. Everybody else in the development community thought he was out of his mind. 
They rented up over two years. There was now a waiting list to get in them. And there's a third tower, which is now under construction after 15 years, which shows how courageous and <laughs> assertive Baltimoreans are. We then turn from there to the Inner Harbor. You see that body of water? That body of water stunk. That's the nicest thing I can say about it. H.L. <laughs> Mencken, who lived in Baltimore for a long time, said it smelled like a million polecats, which is a more descriptive phrase. <laughs> And he was quite right. It had a fish refinery. Have you ever been near a fish refinery? Well, downwind from a fish refinery is an experience to be relished. <laughs> you will never forget it. And it sat right down there. It's a white colored building just on the south edge of the Inner Harbor. And so we turned from Charles Center, which was this development, this open heart surgery you just saw in the heart of a city, to taking the Inner Harbor from this, very little salvageable. These were tin and wood buildings, to this. Now, this is 20 years later. One of, the, one of the unpleasant morals of this talk and of this business is that, as Americans, we like the 100-yard dash. And the urban revitalization business is more of a marathon. Hmm? And it takes endurance. And it takes perseverance. And at first, what you're doing is tearing things down, blocking streets, making people mad at you. <laughs> because they can't drive through. And eventually, hopefully, something better happens. And eventually, maybe it be, shouldn't be too long, or you won't be there having a job over <laughs> eventually. But it did take that period of time. We rebuilt the edge of the Inner Harbor with a combination of federal and local money. We built this marina that you see there before it got boats. And then the boats came. People said no one would come to Baltimore with a boat because Annapolis is much closer to the Chesapeake Bay, which is much closer to the Atlantic Ocean. But Annapolis had become filled with boats like a boat parking lot. And people were a little tired of that. And so they decided to make the swing into downtown Baltimore, into this inner harbor, which we meanwhile cleaned up so live fish are now in it, which you can catch. And it is no longer a mystical experience to walk across the water, as you might have been able to do. 25 years ago. You can't do that anymore. You have to go out in a paddle boat. Do you see those two buildings with the green roofs? Those are the Harbor Place buildings. Those were the lots that we advertised for 10 years with no takers. Finally, the Rouse Company stepped up, said, we would like to try this mysterious thing that we tried in Boston and Faneuil Hall, Quincy Market. No anchor stores, no national franchises. See if we can do small merchant retailing. 150,000 square feet, two buildings combined. We told them that we were interested. We'd have to advertise this to see if there were any other takers. There were none. And we were then ready to go ahead when the enlightened, wonderful citizens of Baltimore took us to a referendum. You know why? Not that this wasn't shown in the renewal plan, because it was. <laughs> Not that they didn't think this was jobs and taxes, a 1,000 jobs to be exact, because they said that sounds possible. But we had done such a nice job cleaning up the Inner Harbor and making it into a temporary park, they said, just leave it that way. <laughs> Don't tell us about developers, profits, bottom lines, jobs and taxes. Just leave it as a park, and we'll be happy. And it took a major campaign, which was the hardest fought issue in a gubernatorial year. The governor's race drew many fewer uh, voters than the Harbor Place referendum. It passed 55 to 45 percent, which in America is a landslide <laughs> on any kind of issue like this. Two years later, it was open. It'll be six years old this January the 2nd at 10 o'clock. The first year, it drew 18 million people. The other attraction in America on the East Coast that drew 18 million people is Disneyland in Orlando. To think that 18 million people would come to downtown Baltimore is a myth. I've, you know, I've just lied to you, but I haven't. <laughs> because they were there by actual count. Now, why were they there? Not because we wished them to be there, but because we had identified that within 45 minutes driving time of this site, there were 3 million people. And there was no attraction like this, which could combine natural elements like sunlight on the water, like boats, like a stroll along the water's edge, and interesting personal service retailing. Not plastic this and plastic that and general foods, and we don't know who you are. Hmm? You're just a number in the crowd. Take a number, get in line, go through the checkout counter. 
but personal service, special restaurants, ethnic flavor, which Baltimore is full of, that that could work and that could draw time and time again some critical mass of those three million people, even from blasé and cynical Washingtonians, <laughs> which it has drawn in great numbers. So it worked. And from then on, we're going to go faster here. We built an aquarium, a landmark building, not a piece of background architecture, uh, which we got Congress to name the National Aquarium because what they called the National Aquarium was about 10 fish tanks in the basement of the Interior Department on 14th Street in Washington, and not too many people were going there to appreciate it. So we said, we have a wonderful site, we got to build through Congress, and we went to the voters of Baltimore who paid for that aquarium, uh, Peter Chermayev, Cambridge 7 architect. I should mention some architects we go along here. The one building that has survived an earlier urban renewal project called the Great 1904 Fire in downtown Baltimore was this building called the Power Plant, kind of dirty brick building on the right. We saved it. We bought it. It was obsolete as a power plant. We have now sold it to the Six Flags Company for, for use as a year-round indoor entertainment center another unproven concept. Slow to begin, we'll see how it goes. Place to go on a rainy day. This is the aquarium, we gotta push through this. <laughs> uh, we put in some public infrastructure. This is called wasted non-taxable space. Hmm? This is a fountain uh, and a square named after the first mayor, Ted McKeldin, a Republican, as a matter of fact, in a traditionally democratic city who supported the Inner Harbor Plan and this is value creation for Harbor Place across the street for a utility company who built an office building, uh, which they could not do on their own. Now, Baltimore gets very hot. This is a light spring day in Baltimore. July and August, it's 80, 90 degrees, high humidity. And everybody knew, conventional wisdom, that you would not sit outside in Baltimore. You would sit with air conditioning in the mid-20th century because you were smart and only dumb people would sit outside and sweat and get bitten by flies. Right? Wrong. <laughs> the reason no one would sit outside is it was boring and there was nothing to do. And when we created a better mousetrap called Harbor Place and started to promote events and ethnic festivals and fairs, we discovered we had more ethnic, excuse me, we had more ethnic groups in Baltimore than we had summer weekends. So we had to expand into spring and fall which was a wonderful thing, and that if we had interesting things out there, not only did we have to have Lithuanians and all those people, but that word would spread through the mysterious American grapevine, and we would get jugglers and sword swallowers and fire eaters and all kinds of people who are, you know, nuts, happy nuts, you know, they're out there doing their thing. And they would come and perform for free. Can you imagine that? For free. At the Inner Harbor in Baltimore because they would get a crowd and they would pass the hat and they would make a living. And that's what's been going on. And that's why these dumb people are sitting out in the humidity, unair conditioned, because there's something more interesting to do. Now when the weather is bad, they can go inside. This is inside. We then tried to spread a little housing. And I have focused this talk rather on downtown, the neighborhoods, although we could come back again if you can stand this and do neighborhoods. But nearby the Inner Harbor, there were some interesting neighborhoods. The city, in its wisdom, was going to run an elevated interstate expressway through this area. They had gone so far as to purchase all the property and dislocate all the people, mostly black, who had lived here before. The mayor then turned to us and said, look, this is really dumb, and I'm going to get all kinds of heat for this expressway. Couldn't we not do the expressway, but turn it into a boulevard, which was our idea, actually, but we let him think it was his idea, move it to the slightly to the west, save this neighborhood, sell these falling down houses for a dollar a piece or two for a dollar ninety-eight, which you can do with row houses on a Friday afternoon and a good fire sale. Hmm? And so we offered these. We had 800 takers for 100 houses. Most of those people could actually afford to fix this up. We had to run a lottery to identify the lucky winners. Or some people might say the lucky losers. <laughs> because fixing up old houses, which I have done personally, is no fun in games. But it is possible, and you can do it. We then try to pick up nearby some of the scale and color and some new architecture, and to try to do, this is the boulevard, which we got moved over. 
Um, and then we looked around, as people in Indianapolis and other cities have looked around, for other places to stimulate downtown housing. Now, why do you want to do that? In my judgment, which is only one, per one poor person's judgment, one of the key differences in American cities is going to be those that have downtown housing and those that don't. Those that don't won't be disasters. They'll just be less interesting. They'll be less viable. They'll be less active. People lie to you and say how cities are going to be 24 hour a day places. You know, people have to sleep. I mean, I like to sleep. So <laughs> if I sleep six, eight hours, you take that off the 24, you get 16 or 18, you still get a lot of hours of people living there, life on the street, markets. And so we thought there was, a, there was an opportunity to do that. So I made a standing offer to the superintendent of the schools of Baltimore, who had a dwindling school population, because the population of the total city was dwindling. The offer was I would take any school off their hands for a dollar. And if I could sell it for more than a dollar, they would get the more than a dollar. If I sold it for a dollar, they'd get the dollar. <laughs> I wouldn't sell it for less than a dollar. <laughs> it was a fair deal. So this was the former Southern High School. No longer had enough people to occupy it. Now a mixed income project in which 20% of the inhabitants are elderly, subsidized by the government, and the other 80% are not, neither elderly nor subsidized by the government. Then we discovered as things started to develop into what I called a positive snowball, and one reporter asked me if I'd ever seen a negative snowball, which made me think I really hadn't. <laughs> and it was a pretty dumb phrase that if going east of the harbor, we could do a pleasant park, which is what you see here, that some developer next door would take an old obsolete can factory, since the cannery business had disappeared from Baltimore long ago, and convert it into apartments, which they did. And that spawned this, which is another half block away. New housing selling for $125,000 to $150,000, very high by Baltimore standards on the waterfront and a rejuvenation just to the north of downtown of an area called Mount Vernon Square that had these wonderful 19th century buildings which people had forgotten. A discovery of loft buildings. Baltimore was the center of the garment industry. The garment industry was last seen leaving Singapore for somewhere and is not coming back to Baltimore. Uh, no matter how much wishful thinking we might employ, but nevertheless there were these wonderful masonry buildings which are perfectly convertible into loft apartments within walking distance of the University of Maryland's graduate schools which are in the heart of downtown Baltimore. We subsidize, sorry about the slide being backwards, if you can read the, it's called the greenhouse, but you have to read backwards. You have to have those Cinerama glasses in order to see this. So we did the first loft subsidized with block grant money one of those things, <laughs> to a 6% construction loan. Once the first one rented off, the son of Loft and daughter of Loft did not require subsidy. And they have just happened, and happened very successfully. Now, this is one of my favorites. This was another dollar school building. This one was tackled by a semi-successful arsonist who didn't take the advanced course and only got halfway through and learned how to burn part of the building down, but not all of it. So I got this for 98 cents. Offered it to a developer. We found one sucker from Ann Arbor, Michigan, a gentleman named Herb Schneider, who said if there is 75.0001% of this facade left <laughs> and you work with us, we could get a historic tax credit out of this building. Son of a gun. <laughs> this is now called Chesapeake Commons. It is 98 beautiful apartments renting in downtown Baltimore for $700 a month. It's renting up right now. And that made it possible. Our ownership, our sale of the building to him for a dollar, and the historic tax credits. With that nearby comes some Browns Arcade. This was the first project that Jim Rouse's new company, the Enterprise Development Corporation, did to try and make a few bucks so they can use that uh, to help do some low and moderate income housing. This was an arcade. I mean, we have forgotten, we have lost our memories about what happened in American cities. There was a Governor Brown who was the governor of Maryland. He went straight, got out of politics, built this little arcade around the turn of the century. Beautiful little courtyard. This is like a story out of Edgar Allan Poe. But true. Over time, someone bricked up the courtyard. So everyone forgot the courtyard was there. <laughs> we didn't know it was there. Jim Rouse didn't know it was there. We just knew it had a nice exterior. And he bought the building, thought he could do a little retail. This is about half a mile north of the Inner Harbor. And got in there, started knocking walls down, son of a gun, there's a courtyard. 
a found space that nobody had thought of. Now a little coffee shop facing the courtyard, son comes in, sit and read a newspaper, sip an espresso, very nice scene. Now just a touch of neighborhoods and then a few minutes of Washington and you've been very patient or shy or you're all asleep out there. Uh, this is taking an old inner city street called Gay Street, no connotation there, this was what it was called, one time Indian Trail between Baltimore and Philadelphia. And we created one of the first inner city shopping mall streets in America, all black neighborhood, very low income. Low income, 3,000 bucks median. Hmm? That's low. We did a public housing high rise for the elderly. Do you see these balconies over here on the left hand side of the slide? Now I hired the same architect to do this who did the high rises in Charles Center, Conklin and Rosant from New York who had never ever done public housing and said they would never ever do <laughs> public housing because they had seen up close what the public housing authorities looked like in New York and they didn't want to deal with those people. And I said, we can be different and you can do an interesting building, you're creative guys, and they did this. And one of the hardest, most heartwarming aspects of this was going in and having a lady tell me this was the closest she was ever going to get to heaven. And it was a nice feeling. Then at the bottom of that, we closed the street, we invested three million bucks of block grant money, replaced all the utilities, did paving as nice as we would do downtown, did a fountain and a small plaza where jazz groups can perform, and started to get after the merchants, picked up the only city-owned building, which was a decrepit market called the Belair Market, which was wood, gave it a new brick facade, gave it a little pizzazz, and used it as a center, as a nucleus for this revived shopping area. This is more dollar houses. I just want to show you one more, ball, two more Baltimore things. Since we thought homesteading worked for a dollar, we expanded that to a notion called shopsteading, where we sold you a vacant store for a hundred bucks, purely arbitrary figure. We just invented it one day, and said that it's one, if the housing starts going around the edge of downtown, there will be some craftsmen, artisans, who would like to come in, and it's a piece of America that is coming along, and in a very small, not a change the world idea, here and there, we now have 75 shopsteaders in Baltimore doing stained glass, woodworking, pots, flowers, things. Hmm? We then said there's a lot of housing in Baltimore, as there is in every American city, which is too big for current single family, and we would like to get some form of home ownership. It took us two years to think about this. We had to break 17 federal rules to do this for which I was uh, <clears throat> invited to come to Washington and explain what we did here. <laughs> what we did here was use urban renewal money to buy these buildings and develop them into cooperative housing units, which had never been done in Baltimore and hasn't been done in too many places in the United States. The notion of a co-op is you own a share. You, you live in an apartment, you own a share of the unit. The HUD rules we broke I used to, you know, go to sleep by reading the HUD Urban Renewal Handbook. It was a terrific sleep-inducing exercise. And there was a page toward the back called Rehabilitation by the Local Public Agency. Somebody in Washington, you know, was a dull day, wrote this page. The notion was you would use renewal money to rehabilitate housing, write the price down, and then sell it. Take the money back, recycle the money, use it again. Wonderful notion. One big mistake. He said, you couldn't write it down more than 25%. <laughs> well, in some neighborhoods, that's fine. In many neighborhoods, that's unworkable. Well, we said, <clears throat> what if you wrote it down 50%? <laughs> then you could sell these babies in East Baltimore near Hopkins Hospital. And after all, we weren't putting the money in our pocket. We weren't going to, the, to Bermuda or the Bahamas. We were going to benefit low and moderate income people. So what if we just did a few, and then we would explain it to HUD? So after we did the first 200, <laughs> true story, <laughs> there was an audit. <laughs> Auditors, you know, are people who are good at numbers but don't have the personality to be an accountant. So when they saw this, <laughs> they said, stop. <laughs> and so I went to Washington and explained. It was one of the great scenes of my professional career to the gentleman who had literally written the page in the handbook how we had taken his lifeless work and created it into something that people, happy people, were living in. And he was so awestruck by that idea <laughs> that he said, don't ever do it again, <laughs> and we won't send you to Leavenworth. 
And uh, at that time, actually, the, the money we used, the renewal money, was changing into the more flexible format of block grant money so we could keep doing it again without ever, ever having to ask him his permission. <laughs> so it was fortuitous timing. There are now several thousand units of co-op housing in Baltimore. We then stretched the minds of lawyers, which is one of my favorite all-time exercises, because they could not conceive. Now, this is a little hard. You have to think about this for a minute that you could have a co-op consisting of non-contiguous units. Hmm? Not all in the same building, not all next door to each other, maybe not even all in the same neighborhood, but all in a single legal entity called a co-op, which you could get some economy of scale. You hire one manager, one maintenance crew, and it works. Hmm? So we created non-contiguous co-ops. This is Washington Hill co-op homes in East Baltimore, and there are now a whole bunch of these all around. Here's another one out in West Baltimore. This was a falling down block in Henry Russell Hitchcock's great American architecture of the 19th century called Waverly Terrace. It was a decrepit shell. It's now a co-op. And this is what we think Baltimore is now. Now, just a few minutes. A few minutes? <laughs> Thank you. Good backwards slide. <laughs> My lord. This is Pennsylvania Avenue in the heart of the nation's capital. Oh my, not much I can do about this. I'm sorry about this. This is backwards. Uh, the Capitol is on the lower left and, it should, and the White House is on the upper right and they should be in reverse. It's my fault. Uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, laid out by uh, Monsieur L'Enfant, uh, goes between Jack Kennedy when he was inaugurated. You're gonna try to turn this around? Oh. Sensational. Look at that. Hmm? Couldn't do that in Washington. <laughs> That's terrific. Thank you very much. When Jack Kennedy was inaugurated, you know, presidents get inaugurated at the Capitol and they go to the White House. Most of them ride, except Jimmy Carter walked, which was the beginning of a bad scene. So <laughs> they all went back to riding again. Jack Kennedy obviously had not been taught good manners by his mother and father because presidents had been taught to look only to the left in making this trip, and they saw some nice, pleasant, classical, dull, gray buildings called the Federal Triangle. Kennedy looked to the right, and he was really shocked. And when he got back to the White House, he said, we can do much better than that, and that's awful. And he appointed a commission to study this. The commission concluded it was a scene of desolation. That's a quote. And out of that, and many years of study, this was the original L'Enfant plan. This was the area we have now inherited. Hey, I just really screwed up that one slide. That didn't do bad, all right? <laughs> this was a Thomas Jefferson early attempt. This is, this is the illustration of the point that Americans really don't trust planning. They had this L'Enfant plan, terrific plan, Versailles, Paris, great stuff, you know, ready for the great American Republic. This is Jefferson now, 1803, not long has happened. Where was the plan? Tossed in the corner. Nobody wanted to hear about the plan. Buildings going up everywhere. Jefferson said, the least I can do is plant these poplars, which he did between the Capitol and the White House. And one year they died because the soil was lousy. So it was a noble effort, but it didn't take. So here we are. Uh, in the early 20th century, this is the scene of desolation on the right, just a hodgepodge falling down, buildings, a few historic stuff, mostly liquor stores, parking lots, the federal urban renewal government triangle of the 20s and 30s of the Macmillan plan and, and neoclassical architecture, not exactly American forms. Now, there's a picture of Nat Owings that I saw here earlier today. Nat had a great deal to do with this plan. This was the best and the worst of the thinking of the 60s, all combined in one plan. Had guts, had courage, uh, had all those good qualities. In terms of what it would produce, it would have produced a series of buildings not unlike the J. Edgar Hoover FBI building, if you've been to Washington and have seen it. A megastructure, which uh, to put it mildly, is not pedestrian friendly, <laughs> um, and fills up a square in the middle of the block. It also would have created down in the lower, the perspective fools you, lower middle here. Can you see that open space? That open space is about the scale of red square. And you can't quite grasp it here. And it's very suitable for the overthrow of the government or other popular acts, but a little questionable for smaller scale fairs and festivals. It would have wiped out the National Theater, which had been there for 150 years, the Willard Hotel, which we'll get to in a minute, and some other edifices. So. Those were some of the goods and bads of this. The best thing about that plan is nobody had the money to implement it. So it sat around. While it sat around, we developed this notion I touched on earlier of saving historic buildings, smaller scale spaces. 
As Americans, we tend to think big, and one of the lessons that I hope you come out of Ball State with is how to think small, hmm? where most of us live, because the average eye level of the human being has not changed a great deal <laughs> over the years. And so spaces and the way we perceive them in a sense of enclosure is still very much the same as it always was. Now, this is a park. It's called Pershing Park. John Pershing, American general. World War I. Now, there was a definition of a park in Washington. First of all, it was flat, and it had grass, and it had grass that you could cut like a crew cut because the National Park Service could come in with their lawnmowers and cut the hell out of that grass, be out of there in five minutes, it was beautiful, cost efficient, save the taxpayers money. And maybe there was a single fountain with a spout 10 feet high, one vertical, in the middle, that defined fountain. And then there was a statue of a gentleman on horseback, usually signifying some great military victory of America's past, and that constituted a park. We all knew it when we saw it, and we were very familiar with it, and we were comfortable with it. Now, we decided to do a warm, fuzzy, growy, hard to maintain, different kind of park called Pershing Park. Of course, it's got John Pershing. He's right there, <laughs> but he's toward one end, and you can't see him in the slide. And the rest of it has things that grow. This is an early slide. Uh, we now have grasses and bamboo and all kinds of stuff and probably rats. God knows what's in it. I don't know. But, <laughs> but it works and people love it. The water is in the summertime. We freeze it into an ice rink in the wintertime. And it's a year-round attraction. And it's a different definition of a park. We then did a very un-American thing. And I can say to you truthfully, I didn't do it. <laughs> but I have inherited it. And I'm struggling with how to improve it. In Monsieur L'Enfant's plan, there was a western plaza and an eastern plaza. Eastern plaza had been built on. Western plaza was still out there to be done. My predecessors hired Bob Venturi, an imaginative cat from Philadelphia, who came down in the middle of retail on the first floor. And we are about, this is backwards, again, my fault. We're going to offer this former department store, which we bought because department stores are dying in many places in America, and we're not going to bring them back. So we have to find new uses for them. This use would be some housing, some office, and some retail. And we'll be on the street with that. We also do some fun little things like uh, get these people to open kiosks, do some fairs and festivals, even in what people used to say was non-ethnic Washington, which is not true. There must be even ethnics in Muncie. I believe them, even though I haven't seen them. I know you're here somewhere, ethics. You have to come out <laughs> and do your stuff and sit out there in those open spaces, which if they're not there, somebody should create. This is another former Heck Company building, now about to be recycled into mixed use. You must have buildings like that in Muncie. They're in every American city. Somebody has to get them and use them before they're torn down. This is looking down the Capitol, which will still be the dominant theme. As you may remember in Amadeus, when Mr. Salieri was, heard his first concert by Mozart, and he was asked what he thought, and he said it was nice, but there were too many notes. Hmm? You remember that? <laughs> Well, there aren't too many notes in cities. They're places of diversity and complexity. And you've got some dominant chords, which we clearly have, the capital. You can have plenty of other notes, which worked into harmony, give you, hopefully, a clipping. I had to go back many years to find a place not just for ceremonies, for presidents, but for people to live and enjoy cities. And that's what it should be all about. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Mr. Mr. Brody has agreed to answer a few questions you might have. Uh, Attempt. John? Yes. Yeah. You mean educating people to care about that sort of thing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the idea of a university, as I recall, as somebody once described it. To them. Yeah.
Mm. It's really hard. I wasn't fooling. I don't have the answers to that. I, I live in Baltimore and commute to Washington by Amtrak every day. And, and I'm still active in the Baltimore AI and some other stuff. One, one of the debates we're having there right now is having achieved what we think is some degree of success through pretty, for America, <laughs> pretty significant public control. We had control because we owned a lot of land downtown. We sold it all. And we had control because the market was so sluggish that nobody wanted to do more than one building at a time, which was its own kind of control. So now we're past that people think, and certain elected officials, without mentioning names, <laughs> are now grabbing for, shall we say, the brass ring huh, of development, as in the more the merrier, forget the controls, we don't need planning, you know, bring these folks in, let the good times roll, <laughs> as they used to say. And uh, some of us see that, notwithstanding a certain degree of enlightenment, as the ruination of a lot of the good things we strove for, and that would make Baltimore different, i.e. better, more competitive than other places. So, but interestingly, we've done a series of four lectures. Now I'm going to do a fifth in a couple, in a couple weeks. Uh, I think if you had one sort of where is the city heading, and you know, what are good, what's good urban, and <laughs> how do you spell urban, and what's it mean, and all this stuff. A few years ago, you'd have given this party, nobody came. Hmm? With a little advertising, uh, literally 500 people have turned out to hear these things and to get involved in this. So there's a, to me, there's a heartening sense that, you know, 500 out of a city of 700,000 people, it's not a lot of folks, but uh, that there are people deeply interested and realizing that the city has achieved something and would like to continue to strive for that quality of excellence or whatever you want to call it. So that's. Uh, I think that, that's, a, that's a positive example. You can certainly point to some negative examples in America, but I think there is a gradual enlightenment. Yes, I'm still not cynical enough to think otherwise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. Now, sure. Now, interestingly, sometimes things happen in very perverse ways or ways that you don't expect them to happen. The referendum, the Harbor Place, which we hated at the time. I mean, you know, we were ready to build this building. Rouse Company had financed it. We were all ready to go. Were we mad when these people petitioned at the referendum? We were angry. <laughs> the mayor was livid. <laughs> Through that experience, though, more people got involved in that issue who then cared about the future of the city than if that issue had never taken place. So in retrospect, it was very positive involvement. Had we lost it, we, we would have been very mad. And I might not be saying this to you now, but we won it. And even the people who were on the losing side felt they'd had a chance to contribute to the future of the city. Now, I don't know how to, how to replicate that situation or if you can stand the pain. <laughs> I remember giving enough talks that I had absolute laryngitis, which was a blessing to some. And I lost my voice at the end for five days. But it was a marvelously inclusive issue. People said, this is important to the city, and it's important we think seriously about it. And every city could use that kind of, of episode. Three for a quarter, yes. <laughs> when the Harbor Place thing? Well, it was, it was one of my screwy ideas. I mean, I, I thought. The people who didn't want Harbor Place, it was a mixed bag. It was an election year. There was a particular guy running for state senator who saw this as a, as a platform for himself, which he would readily admit you know, was an issue. He thought he could get some votes around it. There were some uh, sincere environmentalist people who thought, notwithstanding the original plan, should be parks, open space, motherhood, nice stuff. You know, it's fine. Uh, understand that. There were people who said it's a great idea, but don't put it there, move it a mile east into the power plant or half a mile east. And unfortunately, these things either work or don't work <laughs> at very carefully calibrated locations. And you can't move things a mile east and have the same parking and the same access, and it doesn't work, unfortunately. So we didn't have that easy out. So those were the, and also, oh, right next to this was an area in Baltimore, Little Italy which was an original Italian settlement. It's now settled by restaurant tours. It's got about 30 Italian restaurants. They were convinced that one Italian restaurant in Harbor Place was going to be the ruination of Little Italy, which was, you know, crazy. But they honestly believed it. And they hired a PR guy 
who got lots of ink <laughs> and uh, media attention, you know, and did all kinds of stunts. And I've gotten a lot of free bottles of wine in Little Italy in recent years by restaurateurs who said we were wrong, and you know, I was right and they were wrong, and this has only been good for business. Uh, but at the time, they were an important force. So there were all this kind of mixed motives, all right? And in Baltimore, it's very easy to get something on the ballot by referendum. It's like uh, 10,000 signatures, you know, you could get it in favor of, I don't, I don't know, one-legged cucker spaniels, or you know, put somebody out on the street corner, you get 10,000 signatures, you're on the ballot. Uh, you could do it. So the mayor, we were all sitting around depressed about you know what was going to happen. The thing was going to sink like a stone. Rouse Company was going to go away. And I had the idea, for better or worse, at the time the mayor looked at me like I'd absolutely lost my mind and said that we've got to have our own referendum so people can vote for something instead of against something. And so our referendum was, <laughs> if you vote, for 3.1 acres of development, Harbor Place, you get <laughs> 26 acres of parkland permanently enshrined in the city charter of Baltimore. It's what you see in green. It's what you got. That's what's sold. If we had just run the election on be in favor of development versus in favor of park and open space, I think it would not have won. And enough people, not just the city, but enough people saw that that was a reasonable balance, uh, that, that they supported it. Happy story. <laughs> Happy ending. Yes, sir. It is. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I should say that the city in Baltimore got into the development business not out of a sense of, uh, we want to do this. We got into it out of a sense of desperation, that if we didn't do it, we were going to be, <laughs> there was going to be no downtown. We were a, a, not even a, a bathroom spot, shall we say, between Washington and Philadelphia. <laughs> not even a pit stop, you know. Um, Baltimore has a number of disadvantages. I mean, it's not like Boston, which is a regional city for New England, or Seattle, which is a regional city for the Northwest. It's got intense nearby competition. And so we saw the, that to give us a shot at competing, we had to do a number of perhaps extraordinary things. And people were willing to do them, and, and voters were willing to do them. I mean, these things were financed by bond issues, put on the ballot, people having a chance to say, this is nuts, we're voting against it, where this is good, we're voting in favor of it. Every election. And we made a point of that. We would never ask you to vote for $20 million because you were going to vote no. <laughs> I know you. You would vote no. <laughs> but if I asked you for $2 million, 10 times, you might vote yes. <laughs> All right? And if at each interval you saw your $2 million producing some products, you were very inclined to vote yes. So that's what fueled this public intervention. Plus block grant money, plus UDAG grants, plus anything we could lay our hands on. Plus some private investment. But at the beginning, very heavily, publicly, uh, under undergirded, without question. Now much less so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that. It was in Boston. Yes. What quotation would you Well, I've used too many quotations already. Well, I think it's a combination, actually. I mean, I think make no small plans. I mean, forget Burnham, who said it. But the notion of a plan that's big enough to get people enthusiastic about it is very pertinent to human nature. People don't get enthusiastic about a little park on the corner. You might or I might, but not enough people will. So, I mean, to, to change people's vision of an old, decrepit, dirty city that hadn't had a new building built in its downtown for 30 years, which was Baltimore, you needed a pretty big plan, whether it was Burnham's or somebody's. But you needed the other side of that is you needed to be able to produce pieces of it in your lifetime so that you weren't voting for bond issues that your kids might live to see something happen so it could be broken down in pieces. And we consciously, we were pouring concrete every year. <laughs>
There was a piece of a promenade, there was a temporary park, there was a new something, even if it was very small. We found some poor guy who wanted to build, it was his life's dream, to build a Chesapeake Bay skipjack, hmm? which is an almost obsolete form of boat that used to do a lot of business around the Chesapeake Bay. We found this guy a spot on the inner harbor where he had clean, cleared land to build his, ship, his skipjack. It took him two years. We told him to work slow. We didn't have anything else to, to replace him once he, once he left. <laughs> and so we were constantly looking for things to get people enthused. Gee, did you see that? You know, we come back next year, you're going to see this. Come back the following year, you're going to see something else. So constantly looking, and real stuff, not just uh, PR, not just hype. So the combination of the Burnham and Jane Jacobs, which produces, if you crossed a Burnham with a Jane Jacobs, what would you get? I don't know. <laughs> It's a stunning idea. I never thought I never thought about it before. Uh, she's in Toronto and he's dead, so I don't, I don't think there's much chance of crossing them. Uh, but I think it's the combination that makes sense. Yes. Well, I don't know Muncie well enough to give you an intelligent comment, really. But but I think the, the we were talking about. I, th I think a lot of the the problems, a lot of the questions, rather, whether it's a Baltimore, Washington, or Muncie, are very much the same. The difference is scale, hmm? and not that the answers are immediately replicable. You can't pick them up and just put them. But I don't think the answers are harder. Hmm? But I think somebody has to have. I mean, I, honestly, this is going to sound like. Uh, <laughs> Snake oil salesman or whatever, except I don't have any snake oil to sell. Only people in Muncie can decide what Muncie wants to be in the future. Nobody can come in and tell them. They can try, but it won't stick. Hmm? So somebody here has got to care enough to develop a vision of Muncie for the future. Now, frankly, if nobody cares, you know, it will become all strip. Hmm? It'll go out, whatever, what's that street? Medellin. It eventually it'll get to Indianapolis, wherever it goes, or San Francisco, or I don't know. <laughs> you know, it'll keep going. Huh? And there'll be no, nothing left where it came from. Hmm? Now, I mean, if, that's, if enough people say that's okay, or we're not thrilled about it, but it's too hard to change, costs too much money, you know, we're more interested in other things, that's what'll happen. You know, we tend to get what we want and what we're willing to work for. So, but I mean, if there's, and you can't, I think as in the Harbor Place instance, you can't say, gee, that's a, that's a terrible vision. It's unurban. People are going to cross the street, they're going to have accidents, it's environmentally bad, it's ugly. That's about 90th down the list, you know, it's ugly. It's got to be inefficient and all kinds of bad things. And let's say we all agree on that. Somebody's got to construct an alternative vision for Muncie. Because you can't fight something with nothing. I've never seen it work. Hmm? And so somebody's got to work at what is that alternative or not just one, maybe there are several alternatives. You know, and in the heat of passion of what is American debate, town meetings, this thing the country grew up on, it's great stuff. I believe in that. Hmm? Fight about it. Hmm? Get mad about it. <laughs> then maybe somebody gets enthusiastic about it. And then you've got something you can build on. But until that happens, life just oozes out, which was what was happening to the cities across the country. So the, what the answer is, I don't know. I think the process is something like that. A couple more before we go to see the second half of Duke and Louisville. <laughs> yes? How did it get started in Baltimore? Is it your notion that the, the small group of the small power elites that you <laughs> terrible or the neighborhoods? What's your feeling? So the, que the question is, because people can't hear back there, did, did some small power elite get this <laughs> started in Baltimore? My wife would love the elite part. <laughs> um, well, the mayor used to say, one of the mayors, that there were about five of us who were enthusiastic about Baltimore. And if we could get five more, if each of us could get five more people enthusiastic, we could then start a revolution with a mimeograph machine. You know, it was the other essential piece of Lenin starting <laughs> the, the Russian Revolution. You had to get handbills out up on the wall. So I think it was a relatively small group of people. And initially, I think the importance of the small group was that they weren't all business, were all government, were all ethnic, or they were a mixture. Hmm? 
There was Jim Rouse, there were a couple other business people who said the city isn't dead, it's just there's a real market here, it's just been undervalued. There were a couple political people who were willing to say this is, you know, this is, I, I have convictions about this as a politician. Hmm? If you don't like it, you're going to vote against me. If you do like it, you'll vote for me. That takes some courage. Because th these have been issues that have lost in some cities, obviously. Uh, and then there were some neighborhood people. And, you know, I spent uh, <laughs> most of my nights working in low-income black neighborhoods um, in which it wasn't particularly popular to work with city government at all, particularly in the 60s, I can tell you, for those, for those of you who aren't here. I mean, people got bricks thrown through their windows. They got uh, unpleasant things said about their kids. They, uh, so it took some individual courage to say, you know, we're willing to not just sit back and say, that, you know, we can't trust you, Whitey, we can't trust you, government, you know, but we're going to work with you and try to get something better out of this because it's important to us. So, um, but it is finding a handful of those people who are willing to make that kind of commitment. I can't believe they're not in Muncie. Last question? Hmm? Up to you. I mean, I'm willing. Yes. Uh, I'm here. So it's, uh, yeah. Ed Bacon was here. Oh, yes. And he, uh, I can't recall the exact uh, phraseology, but what he suggested was in order to keep politicians from giving you a hard time when you <coughs> do something, yes. that you sort of uh, co opted the future in the sense that uh, you, had, you did things so far in the future that they would no longer be in office anyway. So they don't care about it. And then by the time the huh. people come along, it's something that you've already decided. You seem to be saying just the opposite. I am. One, you've got to get the yeah. people and the, 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 the political structure uh, with you. And two, you do so you keep doing things so people see the program. Sure you do. I I've agreed with Ed Bacon on lots of things, but if that's what he said, I don't agree with him now. I mean I uh, American, the American political system does not work purely in the long-range vision. I mean, the best example of that is Congress does annual budgets, which is really ignorant. You know, I mean, you couldn't run a business on an annual budget. You can't plan just one year ahead. But we do an annual budget every year, and it's usually late. So, <laughs> as I well know, uh, sure. I mean, so we are a very, you know, astigmatic society. We tend to see very short-range things. Now, most of us in our lives, you know, that's the way we live. You know, there are those of us who believe in the great by and by, but we'd like to see some action today or tomorrow or next year. So I don't think that's unreasonable. I think he had the luxury of a time in Philadelphia when there was so little going on that, you know, that, that the long-range planning was something one could could get people around and, and build a constituency for it. And he did, a, he did a marvelous job of it. But I think it's a different world today. I think things are moving a lot faster. And you, you can't just depend on the long range. Yes, sir? Concerning laws, you talk about how you can go to these laws. Laws? Bent. Bent a little. Right. right. Um, Not break. <laughs> yes. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, we've, uh, you know, it's, if, if you can bend something, you should do it <laughs> for, for good reason. I mean, for a lot of years, now I don't know what the situation is in Indiana, but the, the silent actor in urban revitalization in America were the states. Nobody ever heard from them. Cities were doing stuff, federal government was doing stuff, states were out to lunch or somewhere else, building prisons, doing other forms of housing, but they weren't worried about the cities particularly. And, you know, some states were. Massachusetts was, uh, Ida, Illinois, uh, whatever it's called, <laughs> housing th finance, and Minnesota had a very far-sighted one. So we were very unoriginal. We went and copied their legislation uh, for Maryland. You know, we changed the name to Maryland. <laughs> and, uh, we then tried to get some adherence down the legislature to pass it. And the first time we introduced it, we got some Baltimore City people to introduce it, which was dumb of us. We get smarter over time. Should get some local, small town, county people to introduce it, and the city can support it. So we learned that after the first time. First time we got some city people to introduce it. Some gentleman, state senator from the Eastern Shore, which is close to the 16th century, but hadn't quite gotten there yet, said, well, <laughs> He didn't quite understand what these city slickers wanted, but it sounded like a raid on the treasury. It also sounded like communism. That was that's a quote. So it was thrown out. Hmm? Next year, we 
got somebody else to introduce it. We shaped it a little. We made sure that whatever money was going to be in the pot, that it was divided on a formula so that low-income people in rural areas would get some, city would get some, small towns would get some. American political process, it passed. We got a state housing agency. It's now a major actor in Maryland. So, yes, I mean, you'd say in terms of writing laws, yeah, there. I mean, I don't, I think the federal government, I say this without my <laughs> federal suit of clothes on, that, that I said in 19, when was Carter elected? Seems so long ago, 1976, that whoever was elected, no, when was Reagan first elected? 80. Hmm. Yeah, that whoever won that election, that if, if you could just do basic arithmetic, that the federal budget was going to be in such dire circumstances that the amount of money going to cities and to housing was going to greatly diminish. It didn't matter who was in the White House, what parties were in power, that we just had to find other ways to live. We had to leverage smaller amounts of money. We had to do much more private-public partnerships. I use that phrase in a Republican administration. I use public-private partnerships in a Democratic administration you have to, <laughs> to be able to do a variety of things here. But, but that in terms of the money that we had once to do an inner harbor in Baltimore, we're never going to see that quantity of money again for better or worse, but, but the, the budget's got to be straightened out federally, not through this crazy Graham Rudman thing that's going on now, but through some more rational system. We can't pass these deficits on. The trade, the trade balance is not in balance. You know, we have some major economic problems as a country. You cannot put, at least I can't even, and I love them, I couldn't put cities and housing for low-income people at that same order of priority. So I don't expect, as a country, we're going to make those substantial investments. So I think, what are we going to do? We're going to have to look toward ourselves, what we can do with a local tax base, what we can do at the state level, what we can do with foundations. God knows you've got some of the, <laughs> one, of the one of the country's wonderful, how many miles away? 60. 60 miles away. Those lily chaps. Oh, do I wish we had someone like that in Baltimore or Washington. We don't. So we've got, so finding different sort of combinations of actors around this, given the federal government's diminished role, which I think is, uh, simply realistic, whether I like it or not. Oh, we're doing it now. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> if you haven't started to do it, my advice is start today. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we could see this coming and try to, you know, get ready to, to do it so we weren't just sitting there waiting for a federal Santa Claus who was not leaving the North Pole any longer. So, uh, but I think that's just the, you know, what the country's facing. I mean, I, um, yeah, it's the best answer I, <laughs> I, have, I have. Sometimes it's laws. I mean, sometimes you cannot do some of the things I've discovered that we did in Baltimore because it's illegal to do in another place. But, you know, God did not write the laws. I mean, people wrote them. People can change them. They want to change them. Make something possible that might not have been possible a few years ago. So. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Okay. Thank you again. <laughs>